we'll begin by calling this regular meeting of the South San Francisco City Council for this uh, Wednesday, uh, April the 28th to order and a roll call. Council Member Coleman? Here. Council Member Flores? Present. Council Member Nicholas? Present. Vice Mayor Nogales? Here. Mayor Adiego? Here. Moving on to agenda review. No changes, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Announcements from staff. Uh, we have two announcements from uh, Park and Rec and an announcement from the library. So I'll turn it over to them. Perhaps uh, Parks and Rec could go first, Greg. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Greg Midiotti, Deputy Director of Parks and Rec. Um, so I have two announcements. First, I just want to welcome our residents to celebrate the expanded reopening of our Parks and Recreation Services by signing up for our summer session of classes. The summer residents are welcome to participate in a host of our in-person and virtual classes and aquatics programs. You can visit ssf.net slash classes for more information on how to register. Um, and lastly, just wanted to make the public aware that we will be beginning a rehab project at Centennial Way Dog Park near Orange Park. Uh, between May 20th and June 9th, the park will largely be closed for maintenance and upgrades, including replacement of the perimeter decomposed granite pathway and the worn synthetic uh, turf areas. Um, while we regret the park will be closed during this time, we feel that the project will serve our residents and their companions for many years to come. And that's it for Parks and Rec. And the date, the dates again on that, Greg? Uh, May 20th through June 9th. Through June 9th, okay. Yep. Thank you. Sure. Is that complete your, okay, good. And I see uh, Valerie is with us. Yes. Valerie Summers. Thank you, Mayor Adiego, Vice Mayor Nogales, City Council members. I'm here with some really, really happy news, just like Greg. On Monday, this Monday, May 3rd, 2021, the Maine and Grand Avenue Library will reopen for full browsing of the entire collection. This is quite a milestone for library patron services and we're happy to be able to provide once again, seven day access to library collections and staff assistance. Um, we, we will be posting these new schedules on the website. Again, um, the main library is open seven days, Sunday through uh, Sunday through Saturday or Saturday through through Sunday. Um, and the Grand Avenue Library will once again open for six days, Monday through Saturday hours. I'm just going to give you the first two days, Monday and Tuesday, in case you all want to come rushing out on the first two days. On Monday, both libraries will be open from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. On Tuesday, the main library will be open from 12 noon to 7 p.m. and Grand Library will be open from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. Again, we'll push it out on social media as well as the library website. We do have the FAQs and it's a work in progress as we get more questions, we ask for the FAQs, but I'll just tell you a couple right now. Um, computer services are accessible in the Community Learning Center Computer Lab by appointment. Um, are masks required to enter the library? Yes, they are. And we have plenty of masks on hand if you happen to forget a mask in your car or at your home. We do have hand sanitizing station and sanitizing wipes. Um, we will still be doing curbside pickup for those community members who are um, have some health issues or are reluctant to come into a public building right away. Uh, we do have tax forms through May 15th. So come up, if you haven't picked them up, come, come up on down now. We are still providing phone service with tech assistance, how to download apps, what's wrong with my phone, et cetera, as well as reference question access on the telephone. And we're just very thrilled to welcome all of you back to your community library on next Monday, May 3rd. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, uh, one time coming, Valerie. <laughs> <laughs> As you can tell, we're very excited to be reopening, Mr. Mayor, and uh, that's it for staff comments for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And, Thank you. We're uh, moving on to presentations. Uh, item number one, proclamation recognizing May as Mental Health Awareness Month. And um, 
I understand that um, our very own Christina Anderson is with, oh, and she's waving. Yes, yes, how are you, Ms. Anderson? And, and please, um, if you could unmute yourself and remind me the county committee that you are a member of. I am part of the Mental Health Month Planning Committee. Well, um, congratulations on, on getting that appointment. Um, <laughs> I did not know of it prior, so we've got um, some information for the public. I'll go ahead and um, Christina read the um, proclamation, and then um, there'll be some time for you to um, make comment and, and uh, disseminate some information. So um, this is in recognition of May as Mental Health Awareness Month. Whereas now more than ever, we need to find ways to stay connected with our community. No one should feel alone or without the information, help, and support they need. Whereas all Americans face challenges in life that can impact their mental health as well as their overall health, especially during a pandemic, and whereas nearly one in five U.S. adults live with mental illness, 51 and a half million Americans in 2019. Mental illnesses include many different conditions that vary in degree of severity ranging from mild to moderate to severe. And whereas youth mental health is worsening, 9.7% of youth in the United States have severe major depression. And whereas even before COVID-19, the prevalence of mental illness among adults was increasing in 2017 and 18, 19% of adults experienced a mental illness. An increase of one and a half million people over the last year and whereas together we can realize our shared vision of a nation where anyone affected by mental illness can get the appropriate support and quality of care to live healthy, fulfilling lives. A nation where no one feels alone in their struggle. And whereas with effective treatment, those individuals with mental health conditions can recover and lead full productive lives. Whereas each business, school, government agency, healthcare provider, organization, and citizens share the burden of mental health problems and has a responsibility to promote, to promote mental wellness and support prevention and treatment efforts. Whereas South San Francisco joins the state and nation in raising awareness of mental health issues, education and services, sharing personal knowledge and experience living with mental illness means can reduce the barriers and the stigma associated with individuals seeking mental health treatment to live a longer and healthier life. So now therefore be it resolved that this city council of the city of South San Francisco does hereby proclaim May 2021 is Mental Health Awareness Month. Let us strive to ensure people living with mental health conditions know that they are not alone, that hope exists, and that the possibility of healing and thriving is real. And now I'd like to turn it over to um, Ms. Christina Anderson. Thank you again for joining us this evening. On behalf of the Mental Health Month Planning Committee, I'd like to thank you, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council members, for joining San Mateo County, the state of California, and the nation in honoring Mental Health Awareness Month by lighting City Hall in lime green for the month of May, 2021. Our theme this year is hope for change, and lime green is the national color for mental health and represents how we want to shine a bright light on an important issue that can sometimes be hidden or viewed with negativity. Now more than ever, we need to combat the stigma surrounding mental health and concerns. Stigma and lack of awareness of resources are some key barriers preventing people from getting help. For this reason, San Mateo County Mental Health Month Planning Committee and partners have organized 50 or so virtual events featuring open mic, music, art, films, and much more to raise awareness and inspire action to reduce stigma against those facing mental health issues and substance abuse. All events are free, registration is recommended, and spaces are limited. You can visit smchealth.org. Oh, you've got it on the screen. Oh, it doesn't have yeah. this. No. <laughs> so smchealth.org MHM for Mental Health Month. Okay. Hope for Change reminds us to spread and rely on the hope that carried us through this year of change. Thank you. Right. Um, thank you for the work that you do. Um, in the county, and uh, we're very proud of you as our, our very own South San Franciscans. So, um, again, thank you for joining us this evening. 
Thank you. And uh, we'll, oh, um, now I think we were set to light City Hall in Lime Green this Friday, if I remember correctly. Mike Cottrell, do you um, recall what we committed to? <laughs> uh, that is correct. So okay. look for that on Friday. And for the, and for the, um, the, the following month. So. Okay. Yes. And send right. me the bell. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> and send me the bell. <laughs> yes, that was the agreement, Christy. <laughs> All right, um, so we have another presentation. I'll let the city clerk uh, read it, read, read the item. Item number two is a proclamation recognizing May as Older Americans Month. So um, uh, it, it turns out that um, Councilman Coleman would very much like to read um, the proclamation recognizing May as Older Americans Month. So um, with that, Councilman Coleman. Right. It's only appropriate that the youngest council member can read the proclamation um, recognizing May as Older Americans Month. Um, okay. so, so we, we are grateful, James. So and we thank you. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so whereas the city of South San Francisco includes a growing number of older Americans who have built resilience and strength over their lives through successes and difficulties, and whereas South San Francisco benefits when people of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds are included and encouraged to share their successes and stories of resi resilience. And whereas South San Francisco recognizes our need to nurture and continue to thrive in times of both joy and difficulty. And whereas South San Francisco can foster communities of strength by creating opportunities to share stories and learn from each other engaging older adults through education, recreation, and service, and encouraging people of all ages to celebrate connections and resilience. And whereas prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the South San Francisco Parks and Recreation Department's Senior Services Program served over 500 visitors per month through the senior programs offered at Magnolia Center and served an average of 30 clients in the adult daycare program per day. And whereas the senior services program has continued to play an essential role in serving older adults throughout the COVID-19 pandemic by serving as a central resource and referral hub for older adults, delivering over 6,000 boxes of free food through the Magnolia Senior Food Box Program in partnership with Rocco's Produce and supporting the, the delivery of food boxes from the Second Harvest Food Bank to South San Francisco seniors and surrounding communities making weekly wellness calls to program participants and adult daycare clients, delivering activity packets, mailing free copies of the Senior Connections newsletter on a monthly basis to a mailing list of over 500 subscribers, and partnering with the AARP tax aid program to provide free tax assistance to 400 older adults. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of the City of South San Francisco do hereby proclaim May 2021 to be Older Americans Month. We urge every resident to recognize older adults and the people who support them as essential contributors to the strength of our community. Okay, yeah, well done. Uh, is this the first proclamation that you had the opportunity to read? Yes, my first one. So, and, and um, uh, you, you did um, a fine job. There may be more in your future. Thank you, I appreciate that. So what we wanted to do is, uh, uh, James, we need to uh, recognize Kelly Jo Cullinan, recreation supervisor. Um, this was her special ask, and um, you really can't tell Kelly Jo no. So um, uh, we'll turn it over to um, Ms. Cullinan. Okay. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Adiago, Vice Mayor Nogales, and City Council members, um, for your proclamation and acknowledgement of the Older Americans Month this May 2021. The theme this year is communities of strength. Um, so we, in a little announcement, that we're asking you to join us and all older Americans, adults, and whoever wants to pretend to be one for the month of May, we ask you to join us. Um, the Bay Area Older Adult Recreation Services, which is the ORS Committee out of CPRS, which is California Parks and Recreation Society. We came together across three counties to celebrate Older Americans Month virtually. It is going to be a kickoff on May 6th with um, Time in Nature by Doug McConnell. And then throughout the month, people will be able to participate in a variety of free virtual workshops between May 6th and 27th. 
For the full list of what you'll be able to participate in, you can go to www.ssf.net backslash seniors uh, for a complete list of the free off offerings for the month of May. Um, thank you very much, Councilman Coleman, from the youngest member of the council to the oldest recreation supervisor. I appreciate that very much. Um, in closing, I just want to say thank you to all of the older adults and the seniors in South San Francisco for your contributions to the history of our community, but also to your contributions to the future of our community. You are important and I look forward to, and I know many of us look forward to celebrating you the whole month of May, even though we celebrate you every day. So thank you very much. I very much appreciate it. And on behalf of the older Americans in South San Francisco, uh, really appreciate the acknowledgement of the proclamation. Thank you. Okay. Well, Joe, um, uh, you know, thank you for um, all the efforts that you continue to make uh, to enhance um, the lives of, of older Americans. You're completely committed and um, they couldn't have a better advocate. So thank you for your work. Thank you very much, Mayor Adiego. Okay. Okay, Rosa. Thank you, Mayor. Moving on to public comments. Before we open the floor for public comments tonight, I wanted to read a statement um, for the benefit of the public. And the public comment portion of this meeting is reserved for persons wishing to address the council on any matter not on the agenda. Comments on agenda items will be taken when the item is called. If you are joining the conference by phone, you may raise your hand by dialing star nine and star six to unmute. State law prevents council from responding to public comments or taking action on matters not on the agenda. The council may refer comments to staff or follow up. Speakers are limited to three minutes. If there appears to be a large number of speakers, the mayor may reduce speaking time to limit the total amount of time for public comments. Speakers that are not in compliance with the City Council's rules of decorum will be muted. And at this time, if we have any attendees for public comment, you can raise your hand and we will acknowledge. <clears throat> it appears that we don't have any public comments, Mayor. Okay. All right. so, um... So we'll move along to the next uh, item. Council comments request. Okay. If somebody has to break the ice. The public wasn't going yes, to. Yes, I will. <laughs> Good. Thank you, folks. Well, thank you to our paramedics who have administered the COVID-19 vaccines at our pop-up locations. At the site last Saturday, they were requested to monitor those who received the vaccines, and they did it with a smile. A ton of appreciation also goes to our Emergency Medical Services Battalion Chief, Rich Walls, for going above and beyond. He personally brought and administered the vaccines to two homebound parishioners of Mater de la Rosa, a 98 and a 93-year-old uh, women. These ladies cannot leave their respective homes due to mobility issues, and Fire Chief Magallanes informed me that they have been requesting the county to allow them to do this for the past several weeks, but they haven't gotten the response. It so happened that when I advocated for this homebound ladies at the time, the battalion chief was there and he quickly volunteered to do it. So it was a win, it was perfect. In connection with the upcoming Mental Health Awareness Month, we are partnering with the Chamber of Commerce and the Sapika Counseling Center. We will be presenting a speaker series that will start on May 6th. It will be free and held every Thursday during the month of May at 3 p.m. Our theme on May, sec May 6th will be Crush the Stigma. We will try to create a safe space, normalize mental health issues, talk about general mental health education, and we will pledge also to crush the stigma related to mental health conditions. RSVP is required through the Chamber website. That's uh, www.ssfchamber.com uh, forward slash calendar. And one request, yeah, I think it's, I just have one request. Last week, it was brought to our attention by John Baker, a municipal code related to bicycle licensing. At this time that we are encouraging everyone to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, 
majority of which is due to our love for cars, of course. Uh, using alternate means of transportation should be urged and not discouraged. I therefore request that we look into repealing the ordinance and agen agendize it in one of our future meetings. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councilwoman Nicholas. And I, would like I, have, I have that down, Councilmember. Thank you. I, I, next um, would be the Vice Mayor. Um, I'm glad uh, Councilwoman Nicholas brought up the um, homebound seniors. I was actually having a, a conversation with uh, Councilmember Eddie Flores. Um, we're doing such a great job in terms of uh, vaccinating for those folks who are able or mobile to attend those events. Well, I think where we're missing is potentially those homebound seniors who don't have the ability to come to these events. And I, and I saw that the city of Menlo Park, they created some sort of program where they partnered with the county where they have their firefighters actually going and visiting homebound seniors to give them the vaccination. So I, I totally agree uh, with the councilwoman's uh, comments about this. And I would love to see our city move forward with some sort of program that we can make sure that we can get our most vulnerable population uh, vaccinated for this. And I, I wanted to, to kind of bring up something fun. Um, I was talking to Ethan Mizzy, who's a, a member of the Youth Advisory Committee. And we were talking about how our, our youth are definitely involved in our, in our city and being more vocal in our community. And one of the things that I was thinking about is something we, we can potentially do or create was have our very own South San Francisco Youth Poet Laureate. The, someone who can come out and celebrate our community that who is a teen poet who lives or attends school in South San Francisco and exhibits a commitment to artistic excellence, civil engagement, and leadership. I think this is something that we can partner with potentially our library or Bark and Rec to recognize our youth, the show, how talented they are in terms of spoken word and i think it's something that i hope that my colleagues would uh, uh, encourage and i would love to see that we do where we're able to recognize a youth and and honor them by being our youth poet laureate so if we can look into that i would really appreciate it uh, may i um mayor well, you already uh, you already had your chance <laughs> I would just like to speak to, to Mark, sorry. Um, Mark, I, I was uh, contacted by the Poet Laureate of San Mateo County who's oh, willing to perfect. do that. And I said, we'll contact the Youth Advisory Council and also the library. So we have someone who can mentor them. So that's I'm two for two with Councilwoman Nicholas tonight. So. Yeah, yeah. Great. So <laughs> perfect. That's all I had, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you, Mark. I think Valerie actually had her hand up. Um, now, we, Summer, the Summer, director of yeah. libraries. Yeah, library director. I think maybe she wanted to comment on that. Unless did she want to? Did she want to insert herself before the other council people have their? I'm time? sorry, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I. It's up to Valerie. I, is she here? All right. Let's go. Let's go with the next council person. So, um, it would either be Councilman Coleman or Flores. Who's ready? No. I can go. Okay, please. Yeah. So, um, thank you, Councilmember Nicholas, for for bringing up the the bike um, ordinance repeal. I think that is uh, a fantastic idea, and I also agree with um, School Board Member Baker's comments that he sent to the council. Um, I believe around around a week ago, and I also think that we could implement a program um, to to have people voluntarily uh, register their bikes. And so there is this, this online program. And, and so okay, to, to back up a little bit, um, I think that, you know, right now you ask people, did you know that you have to register your bikes? And virtually everyone will say, no, that's, people just don't know that this ordinance exists. But when it was first implemented, I believe it was meant to, um, track bikes and make sure that you know bikes weren't stolen um and that was the, the the rationale behind it but today people don't register their bikes they don't even really exist but there are online programs that allow people to do so voluntarily and they can register their bikes if they want to and it's free it's online it doesn't require the bureaucracy um like it like it did with with the fire or police department whichever uh, city chooses to 
to to handle the registrations. And so, um, you know, in, in the place of the ordinance, also implementing that that voluntary service uh, and partnering with with an, an organization that exercising would be um, a, a good approach. Um, and that's that's the first thing. And the second thing is, so last night. Um, we talked about the idea of a rental registry um, to protect our tenants and as, as well as you know provide resources to our, our landlords and, and tenants you know in, in times of need such as now during the COVID pandemic. Um, I think that and I, I would like that to be put on the agenda um, as I indicated last night but I think that this would also be a good chance to look at tenants protections um in, in general and kind of look at a lot of the the different approaches that uh, the staff uh, gave to us last night and kind of look at it not just as a single rental registry but as a, a larger meeting and a larger initiative to protect the, the tenants and renters of south san francisco and so um, i'd like to see Instead of one agenda item on the rental registry, I'd like to see it be a, a, a much larger conversation among um, renters' protections, basically, and, and see what other things that we can lump into the, the rental registry. Um, and that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. I I'm, I'm, uh, appreciate you reminding us. And I think that um, uh, when we were on that topic, I think that uh, Nell Sealander with ECD mentioned that it would be part of. of uh, you know, a, a grouping of, of um, items instead of yep. um, just just the rental registry. So it may take them a little bit to get that together, but I'm sure it'll be forthcoming. Uh, Councilman Flores. Yep. Um, thank you. Yes, thank you, Mayor. For last. Um, it come to my attention that the reimagined Samtrans, which is a project designed uh, to for three alternative options of bus service, um, is uh, implementing a bus service alternatives uh, for the public to weigh in on these three alternatives. Each bus system alternative sets a very different vision for future service uh, in San Mateo County and directly affects um, our residents here in South San Francisco. So if it's uh, okay with my council colleagues and with you, Mayor, I'd like to request if we could reach out to them and perhaps have them come and do a presentation um, this coming month of May as the survey that is being put out for residents to choose one of the three alternatives is due by May 30th. So I think it would be a very important topic that, again, affects our community, and we should definitely weigh in on it. Um, that's all I had. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think um, earlier today in my weekly meeting with um, City Manager Futrell, he brought up that, um, that item that they were interested in um, doing a presentation. So we certainly will try to accommodate them. And, and if uh, I, I could add, that, that was at the bequest of Councilmember Flores. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. I, I had already brought it to the mayor. So thank you, Councilmember Flores. It is an important issue. And they've already confirmed for uh, May 26th to make a presentation to council. Thank you. Yeah, all right. It's already, thank you both. It's already thank moving. You. That's great. And now let's turn to um, the director, uh, Summer. Are, did you have some um, comment I, when we yes, were talking about? Yes. And pardon me if I'm not really clear on, on Zoom protocol. I was a little cautious about hitting that raised hand, but I'm glad I did it because I have two things to say. The first is that um, Assistant City Manager Sharon Reynolds and I have talked about poetry contests and poetry laureate, poet laureate, and one of my staff members has reached out to a member of the Youth Commission. And I also want to say, um, Council Member Nicholas, that I spoke with former Mayor Carol Matsumoto yesterday, and she also was very excited about working with the combining, collaborating with the Poet Laureate um, of San Mateo County, as well as on some programs for youth on writing poetry and appreciating poetry. So I know she was gonna loop back with you and get us all into a Zoom meeting. So um, thank you very much, both of you for bringing it out. Very exciting and interesting to library people, of course, and the community. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Valerie. Okay, okay we, can, um, we can move along then. Uh, City Clerk Acosta. Yes, Mayor, do you have any comments or are we moving along? No, we're just gonna move along. Perfect. Moving on to consent calendar, item number three, motion to approve the minutes for the meetings of March 10th and March 18th, 2021. Item four, report regarding a motion to accept the construction improvements of the OBAG 2 
Street Rehabilitation Project SP1903 as complete in accordance with plans and specifications. Total construction cost $1,163,723.92. Item number five, report regarding a motion to accept the construction improvements of the Gardner Park renovation project, project number PK1806 as complete in accordance with plans and specifications. Total construction cost $677,345.92. Item six, report regarding a resolution approving an outside sewer service agreement with the owners of 296 Country Club Drive, APN 013-123-010, and authorizing the city manager to execute the agreement for recordation. Item 6A is a resolution. Item seven, report regarding a resolution authorizing the acceptance of $11,600 in Federal Library Services and Technology Act funding via the California State Library to support virtual STEAM programming at the library and approving budget amendment 21.048, item 7A is the resolution. Item eight, report regarding adoption of a resolution demonstrating compliance with the Surplus Land Act, item 8A is the resolution. Item nine, report regarding a resolution determining the continued existence of an emergency and the need to continue emergency repairs in response to the signed Till Diamond Fire. Item 9A is a resolution. Item 10, report regarding a resolution authorizing the acceptance of $20,000 from the Broadcom Foundation via the South San Francisco Friends of the Library to support STEM programming through the Bay Area STEM ecosystem and accepting budget amendment 21.049, item 10A is the resolution. Item 11, report regarding a resolution accepting the temporary transfer of a type six fire engine and equipment valued in the amount of $257,425 from the California Office of Emergency Services and authorizing the city manager to enter into an agreement with Cal OES on behalf of the city of South San Francisco. Item 11A is the resolution. Item 12, report regarding approval of the third amendment to an exclusive negotiating rights agreement with Ensemble Investments, LLC, for a proposed hotel development at Oyster Point. Item 12A is a resolution. Item 13, report regarding adoption of resolutions approving three agreements in connection with the Kilroy Oyster Point project and the related community facilities district. Item 13A is resolution of the City Council of the City of South San Francisco as a legislative body for the City of South San Francisco Community Facilities District number 2021-01. City of South San Francisco County of San Mateo State of California approving an acquisition construction and funding agreement and directing the recording of a notice of, of cessation with respect to the City of South San Francisco Community Facilities District number 2017-01. Item 13B is a resolution approving the First Amendment to the development agreement between the City of South San Francisco and KR Oyster Point Developer, LLC. Item 13C is a resolution approving the First Amendment to the consent assignment and assumption agreement between the City of South San Francisco and KR Oyster Point Developer, LLC. Rosa, thank you. Um, heroic effort there to get us through those uh, 13 items on consent calendar. What's the pleasure of council as far as any items to be looked at closer? Mr. Mayor, if I can have uh, item six pulled, please. Item six? Yes. Number okay. five for me, Mr. Mayor. All right. And anyone else? Okay. Let's go in numeric order. So Vice Mayor Nigalis, number five. Great. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is just more of a comment. Um, I really want to congratulate um, staff and those involved in, in the total renovation of Gardner Park. For, for those who remember what it looked like, it is a dramatic, dramatic difference to what it looks like now. And I, I'm just so thrilled for the community in that area that they can have this little park there. Um, and it, and it's, it's, it's just amazing how what it looks like compared to what it was before. And I, I saw a Facebook video through Park and Rec of what it looked like. And it looks like there's gonna be some sort of etching or some sort of painting that's gonna be on the wall. And um, 
just really quickly, what, what, what's, what is that supposed to be a surprise? No. Well, it was. Done, it? it was <laughs> until I said it, but I guess because the painting wasn't done yet. So, right. but uh, Philip, did I just ruin the surprise? Or <laughs> yeah. no? Good evening, um, council and council members. Uh, yeah. So thank you for the, this praise. We are excited to see the renovation of the park. It's been open for months and has many, many people using it all the time. Um, the mural that you or the etching that you saw was the beginning of a mural that's being installed by Siron Norris. He's a, um, a mural artist out of San Francisco and is really renowned and we are excited to be working with him. And so we've um, presented that design and worked through the, the Cultural Arts Commission and Reckon Park on the design of that mural, uh, Reckon Park Commission as well. So he's in the process of installing it now. We included this in a memo to council or a Thursday memo a couple months ago. So he's installing the mural now. It should be completed, I think next week. So if you get a chance to go by, it's evolving every day. So. Great. And I would encourage my, my newest colleagues who haven't, if they haven't gone to please go and look at this. But don't bother the artists. Yeah, don't bother <laughs> the artists. Don't mess with them. Actually, he likes to interface with the community, so. He does. <laughs> but we want to finish that early, so. <laughs> um, and if, and if I, go ahead. Mr. Mayor and Vice Mayor, if I could add, uh, the Renovation of Gardner Park also won a statewide award. Uh, the name escapes me. Uh, I'm going to look that up. But uh, uh, the city did win an award for that. So congratulations to uh, Philip and, and Park and Rec for that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mark. Then, um, Eddie, let's go to number six. Sure. Uh, two questions on agenda item number six. Uh, in the agreement language, it states that the owner agrees to pay a one-time sewer capacity fee and a yearly sewer service charge. However, I didn't see anything about um, when there are increase, increases in yearly fees. So will this cover us um, in case uh, we, we do have yearly increase in fees? That is correct, Eddie. This okay. is Yang Kim, Public Works Director. Yes, okay, great. And then um, a second question. Um, it said that the owner will make a deposit of 5K for admin fees to the city to reimburse us. But then I, I also said, I also read on another part that it said uh, 2,500. So I wasn't clear what the actual amount is. Can you clarify for me, please? Jason and Hilari, uh, are you on right now? Eddie, that there seems to be a discrepancy. We can get back to you on the exact amount. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Thank you. I guess that kind of begs the question, um, uh, Mr. Woodruff, do we move ahead when something like this has been brought to our attention, not knowing which dollar amount is correct? Um, you can move ahead um, with the authority provided by the resolution. We'll make that administrative change to reflect whatever the, make it consistent with the existing policy regarding reimbursement of the administrative fees, but the Resolution allows us to um, to make that administrative change, um, unless the council is not comfortable without knowing the answer. In which case, we could try to figure it out quickly. Um, but uh, but if you, if the council is comfortable, just wanted to know what the number is, then we could you could move forward with approving it, and we'd make that change administratively. Well, um, uh, Councilman Flores, um, I, I'm going to let you make this call. I, I think that um, if it's not a big impact to um, what's occurring there, it might be okay to wait, and, and these kind of items should be in order before we actually... I, I certainly agree, and I hope that it's it's more on the 5K uh, side, of course, but um, I do want to get that clear and, and make sure that it wasn't just a typo. So thank you, Mayor. Yes. Yeah. So um, back, back to you, Sky. Do you, you want to take some time now, or do you want to come back to us at another meeting? Uh, Mr. Mayor, if we could postpone yes. this for just a few minutes and maybe act on the rest of the consent calendar and we'll sure. get back to you before the end of the meeting. I'm working okay. on it right now. Okay. Thank you. So let's get let's get a um let's get a motion from the council for the consent calendar, all items with the exception of number six. So moved. A motion also by moved. Councilwoman Flores and a second by council by Vice Mayor Nagales. Uh, roll call vote, Rosa. Councilmember Coleman? Yes. Councilmember Nicholas? Aye. Vice Mayor Nogales? Aye. Councilmember Flores? Yes. Mayor Adiego? Yes. Thank you. 
move on to public hearing item number 14, report regarding a public hearing on the fiscal year 2021-2022 annual action plan for the city's community development block grant CDBG program and a resolution approving the fiscal year 2021-2022 annual action plan for the city of South San Francisco's community development block grant program authorizing submittal of the action plan and all other required documents to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, authorizing the city manager to execute all documents and certifications necessary to secure and award CDBG and home administrative funds for the city, authorizing receipt of CDBG and home administrative funds and authorizing the appropriation as part of the fiscal year 21-22 budget. Item 14A is a resolution. And we have a list of panelists that we will enter and Chris from Asante will call them out as they um, appear. Okay. Mr. Mayor, before we continue, I have to recuse you're myself. Gonna, yeah, you're uh, gonna sneak out for this one, huh? Yes, uh, uh, as, as my employer Project Sentinel is a potential recipient of one of the CDBG mm -hmm. grants. So okay. I will recuse myself now. And Mr. Right. City Manager, you'll let me know? We'll make sure, Mark. Thank you. Okay, so let's go ahead and we'll, this is a public hearing, so we'll go ahead and open the public hearing and um, we're going to call the different um, nonprofit representatives. We're going to do the presentation first, Mayor. I believe we have Chris on the line. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm here. Um, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. I'm Chris Romasanta, the Community Development Coordinator with ECD. But before I go into my presentation, I'm going to give an update on the Technology Access Program, also known as TAP, which is being funded by CDBG CV uh, CARES Act funds, one of the city's um, initiatives to bridge the digital divide by providing laptops and internet access to low income residents in the city. So since last Wednesday, when we first launched the program, we've received over 200 applications. Um, staff is reviewing applications as we receive them um, for our first pickup, which is going to be next Friday. Uh, if you have any questions, you can contact myself or Heather Ruiz about the program. Okay, so now I'm going to move into the presentation. So um, tonight, I'm here to make a presentation on the fiscal year 20, 2022 draft annual action plan, which will introduce and open up the public hearing. Oh, whoops. Hold on. Trying to go back. Apologies. Okay, let's start over. <laughs> um, so staff recommends that the city council hold a public hearing to hear public testimony and comments pertaining to the annual action plan. Um, the purpose of this public hearing is to hear public testimony on the draft annual action plan and incorporate. Um, and so at the first public hearing, which was held on uh, March 24th, those those testimonies were incorporated into this plan. Um, the plan was made available from for its 30 day public comment period from March 29th to April 28th. I'm, let's see if this works. Okay, so um, the goal of the CDBG program is to provide decent housing, suitable living environment and economic opportunity for low moderate income individuals and families and the at, action plan outlines how the city will achieve these goals. So um, congratulations on Gardner Park. Gardner Park was actually um, funded by partially by the CDBG program and through state funds. And so here is a picture of Gardner Park, which was from maybe two to three weeks ago. Okay. 
Okay. The next slide illustrates in the peach color where 51% or more of the low mod income residents live which is around um, the mostly around the downtown area. I mean, there's actually a substantial um, concentrations of low moderate income census tracts. Okay. So the city was awarded a half a million dollars for program year 2022. Um, this is a little bit more from what we're used to, so this is great news. Um, in addition, approvals from today will also approve grantees uh, from the Housing Trust Fund portfolio, which will re renew requests of $57,100 to housing-related grantees. And again, if the budget changed 20% 20, 20 or more, um, we staff will go back to the CDBG subcommittee or just and or to city council for approval. Okay, so the next few slides will be talking numbers and programs. Um, so if you compare our entitlement amount from last year, you can see that there is a bit of an there is a bit of an increase. And if you take a look at the CARES Act numbers, um, we received approximately two, we we received $864,000 in CARES Act. So from the first tranche, we received $293,000 where we focused on economic developments, the small business loan program. And in the second tranche, we received $574,000. And we here we're focusing on the digital divide. So providing expanding access to Wi-Fi and in corridors that really need them the most, also our laptop and internet access program. Um, in addition, the city receives home administrative funds, which, which generally goes to Project Sentinel. Um, that's 1% of um, an admin fee that is uh, that comes from the that comes from the county. So in total, um, our our budget for fiscal year 22 is $588,000. Okay. So I've added the service so that you, the services to the pub, um, to this public service slide so that you can get a sense of what type of services the city funds through the CDBG program. Again, this is the second year of a two year grant cycle and um, the CDBG subcommittee um, decided to renew all of the grantees at their full amount. Um, so I'm just going to go through them very quickly. So Cora uh, for 10,200, Friends for Youth, Ombudsman, uh, Rape Trauma Services, Samaritan House, and Star Vista, um, totaling out at $77,600. And again, um, public services, we have a cap, which is 15% of our entitlement funds. And um, this, this would reach the max of our cap. Um, in addition to public services, the city also funds housing related organizations outside of the CDBG program. These organizations are funded through Housing Trust Fund, uh, Fund 205. These are, um, they provide valuable services to our community, such as home, the home sharing program, uh, legal assistance and mediation, um, housing, housing programs and support services, and our 211 referral service. So um, all of these were recommended to be funded at $57,100. $57, Here's our minor home repair program, which is one of the city's preservation strategies, keeping residents in their homes and away from costly improvements. All grantees will receive the same funding for year two. And um, as you recall, uh, Council Member Flores did mention um, recreational vehicles as, um, as a, a preservation strategy. So um, we've I guess similar in in case study that we have funded mobile home repairs in the past 
at the Treasure Island RV site. Um, but as looking at more into HUD guidance, uh, if we if we're looking to fund recreational vehicles, they have to be considered um, part of the city's permanent housing stock. So that's something to consider, and they ha we'd have to incorporate them into our program guidelines. And so moving on to city sponsored services, we're reducing our emergency home repairs by twenty thousand dollars as the program has been undersubscribed in the last few years. Um, we've brought back funding for Irish Town Green uh, for fiscal year for um, for fiscal year twenty. We originally programmed the funds for Irish Town Green, but when the pandemic hit, we redirected those funds towards economic development. Um, we also have categorized $47,000 towards other capital improvements that we generally reserve for projects that may be shovel ready, that may need extra funding since this is a more flexible area of funding for the CDBG program. And with that, I um, staff recommends that uh, that that council hold a public hearing to adopt the resolution to approve the annual action plan and authorize the city manager to execute all documents that are necessary for the secure and um, funding of the awards and authorize the submission and all required documentations to HUD as well as authorizing receipt of CDBG home admin funds and um, housing trust fund into the fiscal year 2022 uh, um, budget. Let me know if you have any questions. Mr. Mayor, you're muted. Here we go. Okay, I was enjoying some ships, so I didn't want to share it with everybody. Um, let's see. So that completes the presentation, and then we were going to um, invite representatives of the nonprofits at, at this point in time. And uh, Chris, are you going to um, um, yes. be calling on them? Or, yeah, I will call on them. Um, see, uh, Rachel Aceberos with CID. Mm -hmm. Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Rachel Sabaros, and I am with uh, the Center for Independence of Individuals with Disability. Um, I am with uh, CID for short. Um, I am CID's Housing Accessibility Modification um, Coordinator, and um, uh, our mission is to provide support services, community awareness, um, and system change advocacy to promote full and equal community integration and participation for people with disabilities here in San Mateo County. Um, CID's housing um, accessibility uh, modification program helps with installation of things like grab bars, railings, stair, um, stair lift ramps, and handheld showers um, for low-income individuals with disabilities. And those modifications improve accessibility, increase safety, and assist individuals with disabilities to remain at their own home or to return home with greater independence. Um, the COVID-19 has definitely increased the needs of individuals um, to be able to stay home, um, stay home. All who reach, um, who reach out to us, they call um, for they are in need of relief from restrictions um, of their lives. And some of these restrictions could have forced individuals to go into their home, to group homes or senior facilities. Um, and some of these restrictions could have injured and would have landed in individuals in facilities or in hospitals. Um, places that in this pandemic could have increased contra um, contraction of COVID-19. Um, specifically in South San Francisco, we currently serve a family that now has a peace of mind to bring home their sick family member from a rehab facility, knowing that their home is safer um, because of the modification our HAM program provided. Um, we also installed stair lifts and railings to South San Francisco homes, making it easier to stay home instead of um, moving into seniors or rehab facilities. Um, 
We are very proud to present that we have exceeded our goal for 2020-2021. Um, and we are projecting um, to um, serve a little more uh, uh, with the remaining funding that we have. Um, we would also like to share that here in CID, we have increased, we have seen an increase of home modification requests for South San Francisco residents this year. And though we have spent down our funding, residents are still calling and asking for modification. We are looking forward to when we are able to serve uh, waiting South San Francisco residents to make their home safer. Um, and last, on behalf of CID's um, HAM program and the individuals that would benefit from our services, um, I thank you for letting us uh, present and continued support. I'm happy to ask um, or answer any questions that the council mm -hmm. has. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Ms. Severos. I think, um, you know, your efforts to keep people in their homes is, um, you know, more than laudable. Any questions for uh, Rachel? If not, Chris, we'll move along. Uh, great. Uh, Hortensia Lopez. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council Members. This is Hortensia Lopez again with the Executive Director of El Concilio San Mateo County. And I'm here again to thank you for your past support and requesting consideration for another funding that we've been um, recommended for. El Concilio does a lot of leveraging with programs for to keep people in their seniors, uh, adults, young people, as well as um, increasing employment opportunities for community residents. Um, we, we, our solutions are trying to work with South San Francisco residents to decrease energy and water burden, have savings in the utility bills to improve their indoor air quality that impacts their health. And uh, we also will recognize that in light of COVID-19, uh, more children are attending school via remote and adults working remotely has increased the use and the need for the services. Um, we completed outreach to 100 homes, uh, got 30 customers. Um, due to the shared in place, some of the services provided, we were able to help three or four in the pipeline more this year. I also want to point out that I'm not sure what happened, but the committee report shows that we were at zero, but in fact, it was correction we have done too, and I shared that with Chris, and she allowed me to share that with you council members to you today. I'll share a client, um, an elderly lady residing in South San Francisco. We helped her with her energy, water, education, and conservation solutions and home improvements to assist her with her energy and water burden. She was first enrolled in the Peninsula Minor Home Repair Program, which you support. She received new windows on her mobile home as well as a new stove. Her old windows were single pane and very old and drafty. And then we completed the weatherization to the Energy Savings Assistance Program, where she received new light fixtures, door weather, shower heads, faucet aerators, utility gaskets, and safety tests for carbon monoxide, which is an issue that affects a lot of our communities. So uh, she was very pleased. She couldn't believe the difference in the health, comfort, and safety, and also the reduction in her utility bills. And again, we thank you for your support and we look requesting in advance continued support of our program. Thank you. Thank you, Hortensia. Whenever I hear your voice, I flash back to a time uh, very long ago on uh, Linden Avenue when we had our very own North Peninsula Neighborhood Services Center. And, and I was uh, honored to be a member of that board of directors and uh, how we wish uh, you were still there. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. And uh, you made a big difference. Took a lot of leadership role and you were very, very young. Yes, yes. A lot of energy, a lot of energy. Long, really helped guide us through this. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Me. Any questions for uh, Ms. Lopez on her program, El Concilio? Okay. Chris, we'll move along. Okay. The next speaker with Hip Housing is Esperanza Haguinte. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members, and City Staff. My name is Esperanza Hanquende, and I am the new North County Home Sharing Coordinator, serving the residents of South San Francisco, which is also the city I reside in. Um, since I started with HIP Housing in January of last year, we have been able to match 25 South San Francisco residents through the home sharing program. I have really enjoyed working with residents in our community by being able to provide a safe, reliable resource for housing, which we know is important. I am looking forward to when we can reopen the Magnolia Center so that we can meet with our clients and provide our services locally. Thank you for the funding recommendation and your continued support for over 25 years. 
Thank you, Esperanza. Thank you for the hope that you bring to um, our, our residents in South San Francisco that can avail themselves of what it has to offer. Um, very, yeah, very special program for both sides, the people that are looking for um, a roommate and, and people that are looking for a place. So, so when it when it um, when it hits, it's a wonderful day for them. Um, any questions for Esperanza? All right, thank you, Chris. We'll move along. Uh, next speaker is Shirley Gibson with Legal Aid. Good evening, City Council. Uh, pleasure to see you all. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I'm happy to be able to talk a little bit about our continued partnership with South San Francisco, which has been a valued one uh, over many years. Um, evictions, of course, are at the forefront of um, many people's concerns these days. Uh, COVID has brought that to the forefront. And we're here for the long haul, of course, to help enforce eviction protections and to share with you some observations from the front lines. Our work has shifted uh, during the pandemic. Um, court filings have been um, down, which is good. It means the eviction protections are working as intended, um, <clears throat> but we have been flooded with concerns uh, from callers and, and people contacting us about just the moving landscape of tenant protections, which are very confusing for people. And as we look at the horizon of um, the state's uh, financial assistance um, being distributed much more slowly than we would hope, um, there have been sort of an influx of callers wondering about whether uh, COVID protections are going to be extended, which is top of mind for all of us. So we're very happy to see that um, South San Francisco is being, as always, proactive about thinking a uh, sort of larger scope and longer term about tenant protections. And um, that's, you know, a partnership that we have always valued. So um, we are at this point still doing remote services and uh, are looking forward to a day very soon, we hope, where we can resume uh, doing in-person services and um, sort of offer um, some remedies to the technology barriers that we've seen many people facing in terms of getting and receiving documents um, through remote means. So again, very glad to hear that there's um, te technology distribution underway and that the libraries are open and, and providing um, better access for people because that helps them access our services. Um, so uh, thank you very much for considering another uh, round of funding and for all the staff support that we've received um, from, from the city. And I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, thank you Ms. Gibson. Thank you for joining us tonight. And any council person have a question for um, Shirley? Okay, um, we'll move along, Chris. Great, uh, next speaker is Bernie Mellett with Ombudsman Services. Good evening to all to the uh, the mayor, the city council members, uh, the city manager, and to all the dignitaries. I am Bernie Mellett, the executive director of the Ombudsman Services of San Mateo County. And I first and foremost would like to say how great it is to have such a city council that really thinks about the seniors in your community. Um, they are the forgotten ones, and I am really, it's an honor to be able to, to work with South San Francisco and what they do for um, the residents of long-term care. Presently, we serve 63 facilities in South San Francisco, which equates to about 776 residents. And during the pandemic, it has been really a, a unique experience. Um, we're back, we were back in December beginning to do in-person visits at the facilities and we had to reinvent ourselves. We were doing visits through windows, we were doing visits um, in patios, we were doing visits by Zoom, um, iPhones if they had them, we would, do, we would uh, call on phone and for those who didn't have any of these luxuries, uh, we would send them letters and cards and being able to keep them connected somehow 
to the outside world because what was setting in was high depression, uh, confusion, loneliness. And so it really has been um, a unique experience. And I thank the South San Francisco Council for last year's uh, award. And I am really honored that you are considering us again this year. I'd like to tell you one, just one little thing that I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but you have four ICF nursing homes in South San Francisco. Now an ICF nursing home is for those that are mentally and physically totally disabled that need one-on-one -on -one, uh, care and are not, cannot be uh, taken into a residential care facility or a, um, a regular nursing home. These are one-on-one -on -one and these people are very, very compromised. And we have four of them in South San Francisco. And I can't thank you enough for really for supporting these who really, they need all the advocacy they can get. And that's what our role is to be able to advocate for all these people. We have some very happy people. We have some very people that are not too happy. So on behalf of the Ombudsman Program, I wanna thank all of you for, as I said, the past um, support you've given us and for the recommendation of the continued support for this year. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Bernie. Um, uh, Council, any questions for Ombudsman? All right, thank you for joining us tonight. And we'll thank you. move along. Uh, next speaker is Rebecca Hernandez with Life Moves. Good evening, student council. My name is Rebecca Hernandez. Um, I'm the program director over Family Crossroads. Um, we are a family shelter here in Delhi City. And um, uh, since the pandemic started, um, our services has not changed. Uh, we've been uh, operating just the same pre-COVID. Uh, we offer a program for uh, 15 families that are currently experiencing um, homelessness. Uh, primarily, we do serve families that are uh, residents of the northern uh, area of the county. So that includes uh, residents of South, South San Francisco. Um, and um, they are given the opportunity to work with the case manager to create a case plan to be able to um, um, obtain uh, housing during their stay. And of course, they are also connected with a children's services coordinator for child advocacy during their stay, um, as well as we have 24 hours, seven days a week staff that serve as front desk staff to provide any needs that the family may need, and also safety and security of the families during their stay. And um, with your funding, you know, um, it, it has allowed us to um, keep on operating as such, but then um, future consideration will allow us to uh, continue our services as best as possible. Um, and we're just very grateful for the support. So thank you so much. And if there's any other, um, some questions, feel free to uh, ask. Thank you, Ms. Hernandez. Uh, questions for Rebecca? Uh, yes, through the mayor, Ms. Hernandez, thank you. Um, just wanted to, out of curiosity, since you are in direct uh, service to individuals, homeless individuals, would you happen to know what percentage of your service uh, folks have received a, a COVID vaccine? I don't have exact uh, percentage just because our families do, um, some families that do get vaccinated um, by either the county or through other uh, other organizations, sometimes they do do exit into permanent housing, but I want to say as of now, uh, we have about four families that have been fully vaccinated, and then we're currently working with those that are not vaccinated to offer the, you know, the information and, and um, providing fact sheets for them to consider possible vaccination. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, Chris, uh, next up. Uh, next speaker is Amanda Freeman with Rape Trauma. Good evening, all. Hello. Just want to thank you so much for your continued support of families and children uh, who have experienced uh, sexual violence. Um, and I, I wanted to tell you a little bit about a group of phenomenal young people at El Camino High School. Um, for many years, we've had a youth ambassador program at El Camino High School. Um, and this year, we 
broadened it because it was virtual to the entire county. But um, your ASB president and some of the school staff decided that they would like to do an after school completely uh, completely voluntary program of learning about sexual violence and how to support survivors. And so they got a group of 10 kids together and they, every two weeks they come in, they learn. Um, and, uh, we do an hour of prevention education and then the school staff sits with them and lets them answer questions and process the information. Um, and frankly, as, as El Camino has been for many, many years for us, this is a program that we are now offering across the, excuse me, across the county. Um, and so thank you, South City, again, for your wonderful children and sharing them with us. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much for your continued support. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Um, nice to hear um, what's happening over at El Camino High School. I wish Mark Nagales was uh, with us on this particular item. But um, any questions? All right, we'll move along. Thank you for joining us. And I believe this may be the last speaker. Um, Christina Figueroa Cortez of Project Sentinel. Okay. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm the Fair Housing Director at Project Sentinel. And over the past year, we've been able to continue providing housing discrimination, counseling, advocacy, and investigation to South San Francisco residents, especially uh, in this moment of housing instability. In particular, we've been able to assist tenants who use uh, housing vouchers like BASH or Section 8 or other forms of housing assistance to access and stay in housing. Um, this is really critical when uh, so many people are unable to pay their full rent and are being evicted. So I'd just like to thank City Council for their continued support for our program and allowing us to provide these services. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you, Ms. Cortez. Uh, questions for Project Sentinel? Okay. And Chris, was that, um, uh, thank you for joining us this evening, Christina. Um, was that the last uh, speaker? I believe this? so. If there are any speakers that are not uh, panelists, please raise your hand and the city clerk will put you as a panelist and we'll give you a, some time. Joel Hansen is on. Oh, Joel Hansen. He's, he's a spectator. So he's, okay. a, yeah, he's fine. Okay. Okay. I think that's the last of our um, of our public comment. Thank you, Chris. Thank so, you. Um, let's see. Um, with that, we can um, just close the public hearing and uh, uh, questions from the council. We're looking for a, a resolution. A resolution. I move to approve the fiscal year 2021-2022 uh, annual action plan uh, for the CDBG program and authorize the submittal of the action plan to the U.S. HUD, authorize the city manager to execute all documents and certifications to secure and avoid the CDBG and the home admin funds and also authorize the receipt of the CDBG and home administrative funds and authorized appropriation as part of the fiscal year 21-22 budget. Okay, Just um, thank you, Councilwoman. And a second by? And I will second that. Thank you, Councilman. Um, so we'll do a roll call. Councilmember Flores? Yes. Vice Mayor, N oh, sorry, I've gone online. Mayor Diego. Yes. Councilmember Coleman? Yes. Councilmember Nicholas. Aye. Okay, so before we go to the next uh, item, Mike, um, it looks like Mike is in the process of uh, bringing the vice mayor back. It's on his way. We're, good. While we're waiting, um, Sky, are you ready to go back to uh, consent item six? I am, Mr. Mayor. We are ready. Okay, so as soon as Mark is there. 
Um, welcome back, Vice Mayor Nogales. Oh, there were some great uh, reports from um, nonprofits about the wonderful young people at El Camino High School. You missed that. <laughs> okay, um, uh, Sky is going to um, uh, help us get through consent item number six. Yes, Mr. Mayor. So I confirmed with staff that um, the agreement does provide for a five thousand uh, dollar payment for admi city's administrative costs, but the practice has been for the city to reimburse um, any amount that's not expended um, in um, bringing the agreement to completion. Um, and so what the staff report says is that the fee is 5,000, but that the, uh, but basically 2,500 and change has already been um, expended. And so the balance will be refunded to the applicant. So about 2,400 and change will go back to them. And that's been consistent practice uh, with, with these agreements. Okay, no, that's great. So um, with that, Councilman, if that satisfies, would you like to make yes, the motion? Yes, thank you. Um, so move, make the motion. Right. So um, a motion on the floor and a second by. I can second that. Uh, thank you, Councilman. Uh, roll call vote. Councilmember Nicholas? Aye. Councilmember Coleman? Yes. Councilmember Flores? Yes. Vice Mayor Nogales? Yes. Mayor Diego. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you for that, Mr. Mayor. Moving on to administrative business item number 15, report regarding approval of the program design and eligibility criteria for South San Francisco's accessory dwelling unit program in partnership with Hello Housing. All right, thank you, uh, council members. Um, good evening, Mayor Diego, Vice Mayor Nogales, and council members. My name is Gaspar Anabali, and I'm an associate planner with the planning division. Thank you for having staff and Hello Housing here tonight to present to you the program design and eligibility criteria for South San Francisco's ADU program. Tonight, I would like to welcome Jennifer Duffy from Hello Housing, who the city has partnered with in developing the ADU program. She will be discussing the program goals, design, and eligibility criteria in just a moment. Tonight, staff is recommending the City Council approve by motion the program design and eligibility criteria for South San Francisco's ADU program in partnership with Hello Housing. Um, on December 1st, 2020, City Council approved a development agreement between the City and Genentech to prepay a portion of commercial linkage fees it will owe as it pulls building permits for development. Within this prepayment is a $1 million set aside for an ADU program, which will be paid approximately one year after approval of the agreement in December 2021. Genentech's prepayment for the program designates Hello Housing as the program administrator. On January 27th, 2021, City Council adopted a resolution approving a professional services agreement and the amount of $1 million with Hello Housing to administer the ADU program and approved a budget amendment appropriating the necessary funds for the first year of program implementation. I will now pass it on to Jennifer from Hello Housing to present the design and eligibility criteria that will be used to, to select qualified applicants to participate in the program. Thank you. Thank you, Gaspar. Hey, good evening, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. Well, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Council members, and City staff. My name is Jennifer Duffy, and I'm the president of Hello Housing. We are a nonprofit housing organization that works closely with government partners to help them make and maintain investments in housing. And we do so by helping to design and administer innovative housing programs across the Bay Area. I'm pleased to be with you tonight to share the recommendations on the program design and basic eligibility criteria pertaining to South San Francisco's new accessory dwelling unit program. Um, over the past few weeks, uh, Hello Housing and city staff have been working closely together uh, to craft and design the implementation plan for this program, which seeks to support and incentivize homeowners to add accessory dwelling units to their properties. Let's see if I have the ability to move this slide. So maybe next screen, I'm not sure if I have the control. 
Perfect. The program goals that we hope to achieve include partnering with homeowners to build more affordable housing by leveraging the private resources of property owners to create new housing within the fabric of existing neighborhoods. We hope to establish ADUs and junior ADUs as a strategy to mitigate displacement pressures, support aging in place, and promote and support multi-generational living. We hope to increase rental housing in high opportunity neighborhoods and promote good landlord practices. And then finally, we hope to increase um, a very diverse applicant pool by ensuring that we include a strong citywide campaign to reach out to South San Francisco homeowners who are eligible to apply, especially those households who are least likely to hear about the program. Next slide, please. Um, hold on just one moment. All right. So the program is designed to provide free technical assistance and individualized project management support throughout the entire development process. And we break down the development process into phases. So this includes initial feasibility, where we work with the homeowner to understand what's possible, potential site specific constraints, as well as general budget considerations as it relates to their project. Under design and third party selection, we help the homeowner understand the universe of design options and then connect the homeowner to well vetted professionals who will help them design and construct the unit. During the permitting process, we help shepherd the project through the permitting process with the goal of bringing as much transparency and clarity to what can feel like a very overwhelming and oftentimes complicated process for all involved. Construction administration is where we support the homeowner to manage the construction team. We support everything from pay applications to addressing complications that can and do come up in the field. And then finally, lease up is where we help connect homeowners to landlord training resources, provide template residential lease agreements and referrals to community organizations seeking to place tenants. We see the selection of eligible participants uh, will take place through an online application process and applicants who meet the basic eligibility of the program will be placed into a sorting lottery to help establish the rank order of service engagements. Next slide, please. So program eligibility criteria, who is eligible to apply? Eligible participants will need to own a South San Francisco residentially zoned lot with a single family home that can accommodate an ADU or a junior ADU. Eligible participants must either own and occupy the primary unit where the ADU or junior ADU is being developed, or the participant must be a small mom and pop landlord who does not own more than one single family residential unit that is rented. Eligible participants will need to have access to construction capital to design and build their ADU. So while the program offers free project management services, the program is not offering financial support to design and build the ADU. So we see that participants will need to demonstrate that they have a financial plan in place for the construction of their unit. And Hello Housing will work to educate homeowners on the various financial products that are available, as well as connect potential participants with lenders who offer safe financial products. Eligible participants will need to commit to participate in fair housing and landlord training, as well as program evaluation activities. So many homeowners have never been landlords before and will also now be neighbors of their new tenants. Um, with an understanding that applicable fair housing and landlord tenant laws is a fundamental aspect for being a responsible landlord, we believe this is an important concept and component to include. We also recognize that laws change periodically and with many recent changes to state laws and as well as it relates to COVID, we believe that experienced landlords who may participate in the program will also benefit from updated training as well. Next slide, please. So this slide speaks to um, the initial piece of program design and ADUs as far as rental affordability. The program will not be limiting rents or requiring income qualification of future tenants. And we looked at this by ADUs tend to rent for less than market rents by the very nature that they do not offer all the natural separation and amenities as individual apartments or condominiums. 
And so after reviewing the rental data available for studio, one bedroom and two bedroom units throughout South San Francisco, average rents for these sized units were comparable to average rent levels established by San Mateo County's 80% of area median income. And to provide some context, income limits are a way to assess housing affordability. Um, we say that housing is affordable um, at 80% of AMI if a household's income is at or below 80% of area median income and that they can live there without spending more than 30% of their income on housing costs. So every year, the state and the county publish income limits for different income levels and establish a max rent um, of affordable rents based on these income limits. So the chart below essentially is comparing the max rent set at 80% by the county with the average market rents in South San Francisco throughout 2019, 2020 for similar sized units. After reviewing the data, it started to support natural affordability of these units being created. And therefore the program um, will continue to look at li not limiting rents or income qualification of future tenants. Next slide, please. Additional program design includes allowing participants to determine tenancy. So tenants may be friends, family, or community members, creating the opportunity to support multi-generational living, minimizing overcrowded living arrangements, as well as allowing for the use of the ADU to change as housing needs of the owner changes over time. However, an initial lease must be in place in order to provide evidence that the newly created unit will be utilized for housing purposes. Homeowners who wish to move into the ADU and rent out the primary dwelling will be permitted to do so. This allows for an overhoused homeowner to offer their underutilized larger home for rent, which in itself is a significant public benefit given the short supply of rental housing stock with three or more bedrooms in San Mateo County. And then finally, participants will be required to enter into a deed restriction, securing certain requirements identified in South San Francisco's ordinances. And this includes to have no short-term rentals, they can't be sold separately from the main dwelling, and there is an owner occupancy requirement for junior ADUs. And that essentially concludes my presentation. Uh, I would like to open up the opportunity for city staff to share any additional information that may be helpful, as well as open up the floor for any discussion and questions that I can answer. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Did a member of our staff want to um, uh, supplement um, Ms. Duffy's report to us? Alex, did you care to add? Uh, I defer to my planning staff, but I believe that the, the uh, report was pretty comprehensive. Um, Gasper, anything additional for the council? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for that great presentation. I think we can open up to any questions the council members have. Okay, yeah, let's see what's out there. Who would like to uh, lead off questions or comments on this program? Mr. Mayor, I, I can Please. go um, Jennifer, a quick question in terms of, you mentioned kind of the, the landlord-tenant education. Um, I, I'm assuming, that obviously, the introductory to a new landlord, there's going to be, like you mentioned, there's some sort of education, but is this something that you see as a continuing thing? Or like every year there's some sort of education or is it just an introductory tenant landlord kind of education? Sure, you know, I think we visualized it without a doubt to at least be at the initial onset prior to tenancy taking place. But I think there's definitely, you know, good support out there for it to be an ongoing goal for a homeowner. It just is a matter of whether or not we feel that should be included into the design and expectation and how would we want to try and trigger that over time. But I think, it, <clears throat> excuse me, I think in, in general, uh, the vision and the concept that we had was to make sure that all participants would have access and uh, connection to landlord tenant training so that they understood some of the variables that come into play when it comes to being one, a first time landlord or learning about what's changing the laws as an experienced landlord. And this is more of a question to staff. Um, in terms of doing an ADU, the minimum lot size, is, was that defined and when they can actually build a J ADU or ADU? I'm trying to remember in my head what it was. Um, there is no minimum lot size requirement. However, uh, for the program, they, they'll have to be able, they'll have to have um, a lot with a single family home to participate in the program, uh, which allows them to build either 
uh, a converted, attached, or detached ADU uh, plus a JADU. And so for the JADU, there's definitely differences in terms of what's allowed and what isn't. Like in the ADU, you're supposed to have a kitchen and also a bathroom. But in a JADU, you don't have to have a bathroom. And can JADUs be detached or, or they, are they always attached JADUs? Uh, JADUs are within the um, primary residence of the home. Mm -hmm. um, they can have separate sanitation facilities, but it is not required. Um, okay. And they're typically less than 500 square feet. Um, that's the requirement for JADUs. But for a JADU, you do need a separate entrance though, correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, and then back to Jennifer. Jennifer, could you give me some scenarios where a person applying would be denied other than the minimum requirements that they had? Because I would just be interested in what reasons were some would think they would qualify but yet be denied the process. Sure. So, I mean, a real basic disqualification is that you don't live in South San Francisco or own a home in South San Francisco. It would be surprising how many times that has come up in some of our other programs. Um, another real requirement would be, you know, if they do not have a property that can support an ADU, and, and that does come up uh, where it's just not um, functional via zoning or functional versus other site parameters that, that come into play. The financial readiness to be able to qualify for um, the ability to build your ADU and design your ADU is something that comes up quite frequently in our discussions. Uh, making sure that people are ready to be able to support the cost of construction and the design of construction is something that we get to very quickly in either the application process or in initial feasibility. Um, it's really important to us that homeowners understand, and sometimes they don't when they're first applying, what the costs are that are related to design, permitting, and construction. And so those would be some, some common parameters that, that really can affect basic eligibility. I think when it comes to the consideration that city staff and Hello Housing looked at as it related to small and pop, mom and pop landlords, we recognize that there is a pretty significant uh, number of single family homes that are owned um, by small and mom and pop landlords. And so you might possibly be denied if you own multiple rental units and are trying to opt into the program, at least initially. And then finally, we are really focusing in on supporting the development of ADUs and junior ADUs as it relates to single family homes. And while there is the ability for ADUs to be created in, in multifamily units, we're gonna be focusing this program primarily on single family zoned lots and units. Great. And I think just my last question, then I'll make my last comment. How many do we uh, estimate the first year? I think I maybe 20 to 30, is that? Or is We're that just- We're trying to achieve at least 36 housing starts in the yeah. first year. Okay. Well, co colleagues, I, I just want to say uh, I'm excited about this because I think there is uh, an interest in building ADUs and JADUs. And one of the things that I've noticed from other, I guess the process from other cities is that I think residents want to want their hands to be held for this process to understand it, to ensure that they actually fully understand what they're about to uh, I guess go through the process for. And the fact that we have Hello Housing potentially to do this for us, uh, I think it's a win for us to do. And so uh, I also want to recognize Genentech again, as you know, this was part of the, um, the, the that they recognized that housing was part of a conversation that we needed to have with our partners in the East on 101 is that if you know they are here that you know they have employees who are interested in, in living here but yet they have to be part of the solution in providing mi missing middle and affordable housing and so um, I wanted to say thank you again to the Gen Genentech and Hill Housing um, and the, for the city to, to negotiate that a million dollars uh, from that 31 million dollars so um, I, I will be supporting this so thank you Mr. Mayor. Okay. Um, anyone else? Yes. Um, sorry, I, I, if the council member Nicholas would like to oh. speak first, I saw it. Yeah, I, w I was just going to say that you know it has always been already told by a lot of people who had ADUs that it's a very smooth process having an ADU built in South City, but I think this will be even better for those who haven't 
thought about it. So it's really a good program. Okay. Councilman? Yeah. Um, basically reiterating what you said, um, you know, I've, I've heard many constituents come to me and say that, you know, their, the process to build an ADU that they thought were going to, was going to take a few months was drawn out to a year and over a year. Um, and that, you know, with Hello Housing, and also with HART, I see HART has provided AU combined four plans, which are basically templates so that residents don't have to go through that whole process of figuring out plans and and, and signing them and, and going in that, you know, it takes a lot of extra time. And so, you know, with the work from Hello Housing and with the work from HART, that's going to speed up the process a lot, make it much more favorable for residents to pursue. And I think that this is a really great initiative and, and something that uh, I'm also very excited about. But thank you. Okay. What's been floors? Anything to Yes, thank add? you. Um, I just, I, I wanted to echo, but at the same time, I wanted to thank uh, Ms. Duffy for the presentation and also for really calling out um, that you will make an emphasis to work with the nonprofit and civic groups and faith-based organizations uh, to disseminate and, and focus uh, a direct outreach. That is very important, as we know, you know, sometimes only a, a segment of the population hears about this and is able to benefit. So the intentionality behind your outreach, I really commend and I appreciate, and I, I commend this, this project. This is moving the needle in the right direction. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Duffy, I, I enjoyed your presentation and I just wanted to button down, I wanted to understand uh, this is for homeowners, um, not necessarily current residents of South San Francisco. Hi. If you live in another community and you have one rental home in South San Francisco, you can participate and add an ADU to your if property? If that is the home that you are wanting to create an ADU on and you, you own it and rent it, but you happen to be uh, an owner of a property outside of South San Francisco, we believe you would be eligible. Okay, and but um, you, you mentioned, I thought at one point you mentioned one rental home as opposed to an investor that has multiple homes. So where do you draw the line? That's correct. So we're trying to set the parameter around what defines a small mom and pop landlord as a landlord who may own one rental property, okay. that being a single family home that they want to add an ADU on. And, and, and is South San Francisco as far as you look to their holdings or, or is it, or are you looking uh, a little wider? I mean, if they have seven homes in, in San Bruno and and one in South San Francisco, are they going to participate in our program? I mean, that's a different kind of investor than. Absolutely. Than, I think we would look at it and per our conversations with staff as the overall rental portfolio includes one rental property and that property is located in South San Francisco. I think the intention is really trying to support homeowners who own and occupy their own properties who could really benefit from the support and truly small mom and pop investors who may have one additional property by which they rent. Okay, yeah, I just, I just needed to have that uh, yeah. um, clear. And I, I, you know, some people uh, in the community that aren't interested in building ADUs um, have an aversion when they think of one being built next to um, their property. Um, but I just wanted to say that, you know, I um, having uh, uh, grown up in a time where some families had very large families. Um, I remember in Sunshine Gardens, uh, there was a lot of building going on because some um, good Catholic families were, you know, having five, six, seven. The Kerrigans had eight. So I remember, <laughs> I remember, you know, homes became much larger, and that was that was to satisfy the need then, and it did not. Um, it did not destroy the neighborhood. It allowed uh, families to stay together. And, and hopefully, um, you know, for some families, this allows um, maybe, a, um, you know, a mother-in-law to live on the property, but not in your house, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's just a lot of upside to this. And, uh, and I hope that people can be as, as, as neighbors can be as welcoming as possible. Wonderful. Anyway, okay. Any other questions or more to add? So, um, 
I would we be happy to, to make the motion, Mr. Mayor. Yes, you should. I think that this was orchestrated by your efforts, so you should make the motion, Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you. So moved. And I second that. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for being a roll call. Councilmember Flores? Yes. Councilmember Coleman? Yes. Mayor Adiego? Yes. Vice Mayor Nogales? Yes. Councilmember Nicholas? Aye. Thank you. Moving on to item number 16, report regarding a resolution approving a lease agreement for the use of 366 Grand Avenue for the purposes of implementing an economic mobility resource hub in South San Francisco. Item 16A is a resolution. Good evening, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor and members of council. I'm Alex Greenwood with the Economic and Community Development Department. I'll be giving the report tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, and tonight's staff is bringing forward for your review and approval a proposed lease that uh, will allow the city to establish an economic mobility resource hub at the currently vacant building at 366 Grand Avenue in downtown South San Francisco. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, during the past three months, the City Council has approved a series of actions which collectively have established a new, bold, and comprehensive strategy uh, for local small business assistance and workforce development in our community. Uh, the Council has appropriated $2 million for the program with the expectation that those city funds will be replenished uh, with federal American Rescue uh, Plan funds as soon as they're received by the city. Uh, furthermore, uh, the council has approved contracts with two nonprofits, Job Train and the Renaissance Center, uh, to assist the city in implementing the program. Uh, the council has approved an MOU with San Mateo County in order to receive $200,000 of additional funding and to add a regional component to the program. And finally, uh, the council has directed staff to explore a physical location uh, so that uh, the hub can offer services and be accessible to those residents and local small businesses most in need. Next slide, please. Uh, the, uh, so staff uh, reviewed several available properties in downtown, but quickly focused on one site as being ideal for this purpose. Uh, the currently vacant former site of the U.S. Bank at 366 Grand Avenue. Uh, this site has a central accessible location in downtown, easy walking distance from the Old Town neighborhood. It has a large, flexible, open floor plan with about 6,900 square feet, 21 uh, spaces of off-site parking, and is accessible to transit and available now. Next slide. Uh, the property is owned by Mr. and Mrs. Ted and Stacy Dobos. Uh, the Dobos family has a long history of investment in South San Francisco. And I just wanna take a quick moment to personally and publicly thank the Dobas family uh, and acknowledge them for being willing to uh, explore this opportunity with the city. A representative of the Dobas family is on the Zoom tonight. Uh, Mr. Bob Guillaume is, is the family's broker. He's been wonderful to work with. He indicated that he prefers not to speak, but is available to answer any questions and to uh, confirm the family's support of the deal. Now, the lease that's being brought forward for the council's consideration establishes an initial period of three years, uh, which staff feels is long enough for the city to be able to provide meaningful services uh, to our residents and small businesses as they recover economically from COVID, yet short enough to avoid a long-term financial commitment by the city, which the city may or may not uh, be able to prioritize. After the initial three-year period, uh, the lease automatically extends on a month-to-month -month basis with a 90-day notification period to cancel. The lease term is $1.90 per square foot, which equates to about $144,000 per year in the first year. Uh, the city would be required to pay all monthly expenses such as utilities, garbage, phone, internet, 
however, the landlord has made two key concessions. Uh, they've said that they are willing to pay the first $500 per month in janitorial expenses and all of the property taxes. Th those uh, will result in significant savings to the city's monthly expenses. Uh, as with any retail lease of this nature, uh, the tenant, in this case the city, would be responsible uh, for all tenant improvements, such as partition walls, cubicles, any IT infrastructure, uh, office furniture, and so forth. Uh, the landlord uh, has committed uh, to help offset some of these costs with one month of free rent plus $10,000 in a tenant improvement allowance. Next slide, please. Uh, for this deal, uh, staff has followed the standard procedures uh, that we follow any time the city is considering this type of real estate transaction. Uh, first, we reach agreement on all of the key lease terms, which we've done. Uh, then staff has the opportunity to go through a due diligence period in which we carefully inspect the property. And we try to identify any uh, preconditions that might have a financial impact for the city. And then finally, there's an opportunity uh, and time period where the city attorney works with the property owner's attorney uh, to go back and forth and work out the specific legal language associated with the lease. Now, for this lease, uh, the negotiations had to come together under a very, very tight timeline in order to meet uh, the city's goals uh, for the timeline to launch this program. And so for that reason, at this time, staff has reached agreement on all of the major terms for the lease and we're about 90 percent complete uh, with the due diligence and the finalization of the legal language for the lease but we're not a hundred percent done and as an example for the benefit of the council uh, in one of our recent uh, property inspections we discovered that the building does need some minor but significant ada upgrades in order to meet current codes and I'm happy to report that you know, we discussed this with the property owner and the property owner verbally confirmed that they will be financially responsible for these ADA upgrades. But at this point, uh, that provision still needs to be added to the final lease language. So that's an example of the, the very last administrative issues that we're trying to wrap up, clarify, and conclude. For that reason, uh, the resolution that the council is being asked to consider tonight it includes a provision that empowers the city manager uh, to complete this last 10% of due diligence and finalization of the lease language so that the city's uh, interests are protected before the lease is finalized and signed. Next slide. And so in, in summary, uh, staff believes that the uh, proposed terms in the lease are very competitive in the city's uh, favor. Uh, they allow the fast implementation of a program that the city has uh, prioritized and, and will help thousands of local residents and local businesses. Uh, we recommend approval of the resolution to authorize this lease at 366 Grand Avenue. And with the council's approval tonight, the next step will be for uh, staff to work with our nonprofit and other partners uh, to do st space planning uh, for the interior of the building uh, to work with the property owner to put in the improvements they're responsible for and the tenant improvements the city is responsible for uh, with the goal to open uh, the economic mobility resource hub uh, by the end of this year and we're targeting uh, this October. That concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions of the council. Thank you, Alex. Let's see what questions you may have uh, generated. Um, anything for Alex to respond to? Or any general comments on the direction we're going? Nothing. Um, Alex, um, so we're hoping we're, we're hoping to be able to um, have uh, it be online um, in October. That's October first, right? We're we're going to do everything we can to meet or beat that uh, deadline. Um, we we do have. Uh, procedures we have to go through in uh, contracting for the tenant improvements, but we're, we're, we are doing everything we can to expedite this. Well, I, I guess I just wanted to echo um, some of the uh, pleasure that you um, uh, mentioned working with this particular family and their 
um, management representative because, um, you know, staying away from a, a triple net lease where everything is on the tenant is, is always preferable. So um, not a small thing to, um, to get the, um, the landlord to agree to take care of things like property tax and, and a few ADA improvements. It's not usually that way when you're talking about commercial space, especially in South San Francisco. So um, I'm sure they were easy to negotiate, but uh, thank you for negotiating that, Alex. <laughs> So um, uh, any, any other questions? Let's uh, see if we can get a, um, uh, uh, a motion um, to approve a lease agreement for 366. Happy to make the motion. Okay, a motion I'll second. and a second by Councilman Coleman and roll call. Mayor Diego. Yes. Council Member Flores. Yes. Council Member Coleman. Yes. Vice Mayor Nogales? Yes. Yes. Council Member Nicholas? Aye. Okay, wonderful. And I, I must say, um, uh, Alex, I'm speaking directly to you, that um, of, of everything that we're working on, um, this one gives me the most hope that we can really change lives, um, you know, for the long term. And, and that's what's exciting about that. And to have it in the heart of town, uh, to have it be a resource that might bring people from other communities, which is actually only ultimately good for South San Francisco. Um, I can't tell you how pleased I am that you're putting this together as rapidly as you have. So thank you for your efforts. Thank you very much for that, Mayor. And I, and I do accept that on behalf of my staff, in particular, Ernesto, uh, who's on the uh, Zoom tonight, Mike Lappin and, and Nell Sealander, who've been working so passionately for this. So we, we are pumped. And um, uh, thank you for your encouragement. Okay, thank you. Hey, Rosa, we'll go on to item 16, is it? Or item 17 mayor 17, yeah. report regarding a resolution of intention and introduction of an ordinance amending the contract between the board of administration california public employees retirement system and the city of south san francisco to implement the ability for classic local miscellaneous members in the executive management unit to pay a portion of the employer's share of their cal purse pension costs Item 17A is a resolution of intention to approve an amendment to contract between the Board of Administration, California Public Employees Retirement System, and the City Council of South San Francisco. Item 17B is an ordinance approving an amendment to the contract between the Board of Administration, California Public Employees Retirement System, and the City Council of the City of South San Francisco. Thank you, Rosa, and Ms. Lockhart will present. Hi, good evening, Mayor Adiego, Vice Mayor Nogales, and City Council members, Leah Lockhart, Human Resources Director. Uh, so tonight, the items before you are a resolution of intention and an ordinance to amend the contract uh, between the city and CalPERS to provide for cost share, an increase in cost sharing for employees in our executive management unit, and particularly for the non-safety miscellaneous members. So by way of background on this item, uh, back in 2017, uh, several of our labor groups agreed to increase their contributions to their pension plan, which is through CalPERS, uh, which would provide for um, one to two percent of increased uh, contributions by employees along with uh, their current contributions that they are required to make. So. CalPERS works by a combination of uh, employee contributions from their salary and city contributions, and, as well as investment earnings uh, over time to provide for their pensions. So this uh, ordinance would apply to um, only the classic members of CalPERS, and that means those who became members of CalPERS prior to pension reform in 2013. So those are two plans that are higher formulas, um, the first two tiers of our CalPERS plan. Uh, they are uh, certainly the um, uh, more expensive benefits and those that are um, uh, mostly contributing to uh, the city's current unfunded liability, uh, which we are strategically uh, paying down over time. So in this, uh, this particular ordinance, the executive management unit uh, for the miscellaneous members, they will pay, uh, last year they started paying an additional 1%. So their uh, total contributions went to 8% um, for tier two and 9% for tier one, the highest pension plan. 
And so with this ordinance, uh, they will be increasing to eight, 9% and 10% of salary, uh, respectively, for each tier. Um, and again, this will uh, only apply to the classic members, so those under pension reform um, are left out of this plan because they uh, are required by law to contribute 50% uh, of the normal cost of the benefit. So the city pays 50% and the employee pays 50%. And that amount can change over time if the uh, if CalPERS determines that the benefit uh, is not being properly funded and the normal cost increases, their contributions will, will automatically increase. So this is the first of a two-step process. And uh, if council is uh, approves this action tonight, we will bring back um, in another 30 days uh, the final ordinance to amend the contract. And I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lockhart. Any questions for HR on this item? So, um, uh, Sky, are we able to um, make one action out of these two, the uh, intent and the ordinance itself? Yeah, I think a single motion to adopt the resolution and uh, waive reading and introduce the ordinance would, will be just fine. Okay, thank you, Sky. So that's what we're looking for. Uh, who would like to uh, make that motion? So moved. Thank you, Flora. And a second? Second. Uh, the Vice Mayor, okay, roll call. Council Member Coleman? Yes. Mayor Diego. Yes. Council Member Nicholas? Aye. Vice Mayor Nogales? Aye. Council Member Flores. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to items from Council Committee reports and announcements. Okay, this is kind of the second shot at that. So, uh, does anybody have a committee report or an announcement? We're going to have a small gathering on Saturday in celebration of Arbor Day, but it's generally not open to the public because of the situation we're in. Uh, we'll be planting some trees and we'll be unveiling an addition to um, there's a monument uh, in that park that um, celebrates the sister city relationships we have and and we're added the um, sister city in the Basque region so we'll be unveiling that and have some members of sister city with us so I hope but um, I think it starts at nine o'clock I understand the vice mayor is going to arrive at 12 which is actually when it's over, but you know, as long as he's I'm there. Socially distancing, apparently. No. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I, I hope I hope to see you all there, and the weather's supposed to be fantastic. So, uh, does anyone else have uh, any item that they want to share? So I, I have one last. Um, I, it was a request from a council person. I really don't know what to make of this because the the newest um, council member is already asking that we take a break from our duties, and that he has um, some plans in in August. Um, uh, Councilman Flores, I think, had some commitment before he, he took on this uh, role. But we normally do take in August or September um, uh, one one last meeting, and uh, I'm sure we'll all enjoy that, whether we can get away or not. So um, it's my intent that we it's the first meeting you, um, that you want to to be free from. Uh, Eddie? No, I'm, I'm com thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm completely open just to uh, as an item, oh. a discussion item for everyone. Um, it's it's preferably August, but it's it's up to. Okay, but the first part of August would be the ideal. And so be it. Correct. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to take the first um, uh, that second week in August. There will be no council meeting. So I think that um, that completes uh, the regular items, and we're just to stay um, to stay on the Zoom call. And Sky will become the host, and he will clear off all the people that um, don't have to participate. That That's is correct, correct. Mayor. I, I will read the closed session items before we log Thank off. Thank you. Thank you. Closed session item number 18 is a conference with labor negotiators pursuant to government code section 54957.6. Agency designated representatives, Leah Lockhart, Human Resources Director, Donna Williamson, Liber Liebert Cassidy Whitmore, Employee Organization, Ask Me, Local 829, Confidential Unit, Teamsters, Local 856, Mid-Management Unit, Teamsters, Local 856, and International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 39. Item number 19, Conference with Labor Negotiators, pursuant to Government Code Section 54957.6. 
agency designated representative, Guy Woodruff, city attorney, under unrepresented employee, Mike Fatrell, city manager. Item number 20, public employee performance evaluation pursuant to government code section 54957, title city manager. Rosa, thank you. Have a nice evening. You okay. too. So um, why don't we, uh, let's see what time it is. Um, it's like a minute to eight. And why don't we take a few minutes um, while we're transitioning, if you want to take a break and walk, walk away from the Zoom for a moment. Um, should we say, is, is five minutes enough? So 8.05, we'll be back. Okay, see you then.